Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. My name is John McGuire and I am co-chair of the City Club's program committee. And I am pleased to welcome you to the City Club's annual forum on the environment. Energy policy has steadily moved to the forefront of national discourse, be it the pocketbook issues of the, gas, uh, the price of gas at the pump, regional concerns in Ohio such as fracking, or the ideological debates regarding the extraction of fossil fuels such as, such as its impact on the environment and U.S. foreign policy. The City Club has hosted a number of events that reflect this renewed focus, including January's visit by Dr. Stephen Chu, Secretary of Energy, and the Friday Forum debate hosted three weeks ago regarding fracking. We continue the discussion of energy and sustainability with today's speaker, Mr. Thomas Steyer. Mr. Steyer began his career as a summa cum laude graduate of Yale and went on to be an R.J. Miller Scholar at Stanford, where he received his MBA. In 1986, Mr. Steyer founded the investment firm Farallon Capital Management and became a partner and member of the executive committee of the San Francisco-based private equity firm Hellman and Friedman. A full description of the philanthropy that Mr. Steyer and his wife, Kat Taylor, have engaged in since then is too extensive to uh, summarize effectively here. But to say that environmental and energy sustainability is a common theme would be an understatement. Among the initiatives Mr. Steyer and Ms. Taylor have pursued are the 2007 founding of One California Bank, a community development bank designed to serve the needs of underserved, uh, underserved businesses and individuals in the San Francisco Bay Area through what it calls beneficial banking services delivered in an economically and environmentally sustainable manner. The 2009 creation of the Tomcat Center for Sustainable Energy at Stanford, which works to transform the world's energy systems. The founding in 2010 of the Steyer Taylor Center for Energy Policy and Finance, also at Stanford, which is an alliance between Stanford's law school and Graduate School of Business to study and deploy clean energy by focusing on policy and finance. And the establishment in September 2011 of the Energy Sciences Institute at Yale University to support collaborative research into clean energy technology. Mr. Steyer also co-founded Advanced Energy Economy, an industry association representing the entire advanced energy industry, which currently has chapters in 10 states, including Ohio, members of which are here with us today. I should also mention that in August 2010, Mr. Steyer and Ms. Taylor signed the so-called Giving Pledge, championed by Warren Buffett, in which, uh, as of just yesterday, 81 of the nation's wealthiest have pledged to give away at least half their fortunes to worthwhile causes, which I would hazard to guess, in Mr. Steyer's case, might have something to do with sustainability. I am pleased and honored to present, on behalf of the City Club of Cleveland, Mr. Thomas Steyer. I would like to thank you all very much for having me here today. Um, I think if you listen to that introduction, you should be asking yourself at least two questions. One is, what does someone from California have to say about energy in Ohio? And the second one is, why does the fact that I graduated summa cum laude from Yale have any relevance for a 55-year-old gentleman from California? <laughs> I don't think I will be able to answer the second question today. Uh, but I would like to start talking about Ohio and energy, and energy, because believe it or not, I actually think Ohio is at the epicenter of a broad-based energy revolution. First of all, Ohio is one of the biggest users of industrial energy in the United States. This is a real manufacturing hub. Energy is an important driver of the success or failure of that. So whatever, however much time people in Ohio think about energy, it's very important. Second of all, Ohio is a leading supplier of advanced energy products and services. It's a growing, nascent business, but it's one that's growing very fast. And in a country, in a state that's very concerned about unemployment, this is actually going to be one of the big drivers going forward. And the third thing that's true is the shale gas boom that's going on has incredible importance for Ohio from an economic standpoint. It has importance for the United States geopolitically. It has huge environmental re relevance for all of us. And ultimately, I think it can really change the way the United States is viewed in the world. So from my point of view, I am kind of a crazed person when it comes to energy because I see it as 
the biggest opportunity in the United States right now, should we do it well, and you know, the biggest opportunity to blow something that we've had in a long time, too. Um, as far as I can tell, the United States has basically had two consistent rules and strategies about energy. One is, we want the lowest possible price at the pump at all times. We're extremely focused on that. But we don't care how much we spend to get that low price. So we're perfectly happy to spend trillions of dollars on military expenditures, wars. The, I mean, the Sixth Fleet is on permanent. Uh, it, it's constantly keeping the Straits of Hormuz open to make sure the oil can flow from the Middle East. So we want a very low pump price, but we really don't care what we have to pay for it. And the second thing that's true is we've decided that having secure electricity is of paramount importance, and therefore the, the economic structure that we're going to use to ensure that is a monopoly. So if, like John Adams and Kevin Shaw and me, you went to business school, those are probably two of the things that you learn are not true. The monopoly is the, probably the least effective, efficient economic organization, and you should do full cost accounting. At no time is it good to think that you know, there are going to be expenses that you don't include. In a society that doesn't include expenses, you'll end up overusing that uh, resource to a great extent, which is what we actually end up doing with energy. Um, America's energy is very regional based. It's very different from state to state. It's very, you know, both in terms of how we generate energy and how we use energy. So that, for instance, in Ohio, over 90%, I think, of the energy here is really coal based. You have a really long tradition of manufacturing. You know, the, as I've gone around over the last two days and visited different companies, it's actually been incredibly fun for somebody from California to walk into these companies because all of them have people who are very practical, very thoughtful, and extremely cheap. So at every single place you'll walk in and they'll go, now this particular machine costs $150,000 if you buy it from Germany. And we've seen those German machines. We can produce that for $20,000. And, you know, my father and I built that, you know, six months ago, and we really think it's a lot better than the $150,000 machine. And that is something which, for somebody from California, where we're used to paying retail for virtually everything, it's extremely refreshing. And from a competitive standpoint, it's very encouraging, because that's why Ohio is a manufacturing center, because people actually know how to make things, and they're cheap, and they're very practical. So from my point of view, seeing people with those, those are not trivial capability, seeing that in the real world and seeing people talk about what that means from a business structure and cash flow standpoint is extremely, I mean, as an, a, a humble MBA, that, believe it or not, that's exciting. Um, but if you think about how California uses energy and how it generates energy, we have virtually no coal. You know, we are a, a society, also, a state also that does almost no manufacturing. We have a lot of companies headquartered in California, but we really do very little manufacturing there, and we use about half the energy per capita that, this, that the country does as a whole. Part of the reason for that is we have extremely high-cost energy. I mean, I was talking to a gentleman this morning who has a really neat business that is a waste-to-energy business, and he, he produces uh, natural gas, and he was telling me that at one point he was getting paid 1.7 cents per kilowatt hour which in California, that is about an eighth of what it costs per kilowatt hour. So he was getting, the idea that someone could get paid 1.7 cents per kilowatt hour, for me, it's about 12 cents. So it was, it, it, the states are very different. And in thinking about energy in the United States, you really have to be aware of the differences between regions, regions both the different capabilities and the different challenges. Um, but the one thing that is true in 2012 that I think is true across the nation is we actually have an, a, a time when we can turn this from what has traditionally been an American problem since about 1950, when we started to import more and more foreign oil, into a real American strength. This is a chance for us. This is a real opportunity for us to change how we compete in the world. It's a chance for us to change how we're viewed in the world, I believe. And it's a chance for us to change 
what we, how we handle the environment going forward, and it has huge ramifications, which is why I'm a crazy loon on this subject. Um, one thing you should know, which John alluded to, is I am a professional investor. I mean, I've been in the private sector for 30 years. We basically invest mostly for college endowments and foundations. But what that means is I'm pretty, I like to think I'm pretty analytical. I like to look at problems and get all the information. I try not to be too judgmental beforehand. I like to be able to analyze things quietly and make decisions. And I believe that energy is an area that is absolutely rife for that kind of thinking. Because I think to a very large extent, people don't have a framework for thinking about energy problems. And so as a result, we get into what I think of as religious thinking. So that people are, they hate nuclear energy, or they love solar energy. And from my point of view, I really don't hate or love nuclear or solar energy. My question for my friends, and I have several close friends who really believe that nuclear is the future, is what does it cost per kilowatt hour to produce nuclear energy? What are the costs you're not telling, about, telling me about in terms of spent fuel? What are you going to do about that? And how does that compare to all the other opportunities to generate energy in our society? So for instance, I'm from San Francisco, and the former mayor of San Francisco, who's now the lieutenant governor of California, is a very charismatic and good-looking gentleman named Gavin Newsom. And Gavin's a really fun guy to know. And he always used to talk to me about wave technology, that we were going to harness the tides coming into San Francisco Bay. And that was going to be the way that we were going to solve the energy problem. I have nothing for or against wave technology. But at no point did Gavin talk to me about what it was going to cost per kilowatt hour using wave technology. At no point did we get into if, how much equipment was going to be necessary in order to do this. At no point did we talk about the amount of energy that could be generated that way. And really, from the standpoint of society, those are the questions. They're pretty simple questions, and they're not religious. So that um, it, I, I found, I bet if we really went through it, Gavin didn't know the answer to any of those questions. It was sort of like a science fiction novel where someone comes up with a new technology and you think, and it's actually destructive because we have to make decisions as a society here. We have to have a strategy. And if people really think that there's going to be some technology that is undisclosed and undiscovered that's going to save us, it's going to prevent us from making the decisions that we have to make now between the things that are available. So let me just tell you how I got into this, uh, onto this subject, because I really am, you know, a private sector person who was trying to lead a reasonably private life. And, and the reason was this. There was a pro California has a lot of propositions on the ballot, and two out-of-state oil companies tried to change our energy policy in 2010 they thought it would be good for their bottom line. They were basically refiners from Texas. And there had been a history in California of fights on the ballot between energy companies and environmentalists. And traditionally, the energy companies had won. So that going back to 1965, there had been a big fight on basically the state charging a tax on lifting costs. 48 states in the United States charge attacks on, for bringing oil out of the ground. California tried to win. They got beaten back. And then they had that same fight again in 2006. And the oil companies just completely killed the environmentalists. It was really expensive. One guy wrote a check for $70 million. They still got crushed. And basically, everyone decided it wasn't worth it to fight the oil companies anymore, that it was a losing battle. They were too good politically, and they were too rich. So these guys put this on the ballot. And I really had no reason to do it. But the fact was, no one else would do it. The, you know, it was a situation where people felt it's just too expensive and you're going to lose anyway, so don't do it. And what happened, so I have a slightly bad temper, at least. And I was so annoyed that I said, you know, it's just really can't happen. And I was lucky enough to hook up with a really great guy named George Schultz, who was in the Nixon administration and the Reagan administration. So that we had somebody, I had a partner, who was a Republican and a real, a very well-respected Republican, so it was a bipartisan thing. And we could basically go out and figure out 
how to talk to people about energy in the state of California. And the traditional way that people have talked about energy, and I can see it right now in the state of Ohio, if you'll excuse me for saying so, is that it breaks down into jobs versus the environment. That basically the companies claim, we can't have any regulation whatsoever or we'll go bankrupt. And the environmentalists say, we really can't allow you to do any of the things you want to do or the environment will be destroyed. And that is uh, the framework that we've seen in these discussions now for decades. And it was a framework which, looking at this proposition and looking at the polling, absolutely couldn't work for us. You know, that is, a, that is the wrong way to think about this, but it's also the wrong way to fight it politically. I think that traditionally people had wanted to fight on environmental grounds. And from a polling standpoint, to be a crass and realistic political person doesn't work, does not poll. The two things that poll that have to do with energy are jobs and health. So that what people can care about, what they will actually vote about, are things that are proximate to them and their family. And the translation for environmentalism to Americans is the health. So that if we showed a 15 second ad with the spokesperson from the American, from the American Lung Association and it showed smokestacks going up and then said, you know, who are you going to vote for in this? I'm from the American Lung Association. We've been protecting people, people's health for 50 years, and I'm telling you to vote against this proposition. People absolutely believed it and thought it was important, and it had great impact. The previous campaign in 2006, when it was a fight about energy lifting costs in the environment, they literally had shown fields of daisies and young people running through them, and that had absolutely no impact whatsoever. <laughs> and I can assure you, if you think about how people react and what they care about, people don't have really long horizons in making decisions. And you know, if you think about health, people will do a lot of things. I certainly eat a lot of things that I know are not particularly good for me, but I figure it's not gonna, and nothing's going to happen in the near term. So once you turn that into an environmental question, those are really long considerations, and they are too long for, to actually change people's behavior. The other thing that changes people's behavior is jobs, because traditionally industry had said, anything you do from a regulatory standpoint is a job killer. And we basically were able to say, we're talking about the jobs of the future, not the jobs of the past. I'm a business person. This is the way we're going to go. This, these are the industries that we're going to create. They're going to let us compete going forward. There are a lot more jobs here than there are in the businesses that are basically have gone away or not coming back to California. So you can feel bad about that, but let's please do something about that. And we got over half the chambers of commerce in the state of California to support us. And we, love, we won every single you know, ethnicity, gender. We won the Republican vote. We won virtually every county. And the reason was we were able to convince people that on the jobs issue was at least a push and that on the health issue it was really important. And they scored it as 85% of the people who voted for us said it was important. And in, in an election, if people agree with you, that's really not enough. They actually have to care. And in this case, you couldn't run a state for statewide office in the state of California that year without taking a position on this, and the Republican who was running for governor supported us, and the sitting Republican governor supported us. So it really was a changed framework for how people thought about energy from any of the conversations that had happened in California beforehand. And I must say that if you've watched how the White House has changed how they've talked since 2010, everybody has started to try and adopt the framework that we used because it actually worked. And in some of the EPA fights, people ran ads against people who voted against the EPA in some of those early uh, decisions. And the ads, which I saw, were incredibly powerful and they'd be very short spots, but they'd show a young girl with a respirator and then they'd show some smokestacks and they would ask, you know, why they went after one Republican and one Democrat. It was very bipartisan. And they would say, you know, why are you voting for the polluters instead of the people? And they moved these people's approval ratings 9% in a matter of a week or two. 
And the people would then call up and say, please stop running these ads. Which, from the point of view of political advertising, that's like a home run. That's when you really... <laughs> Because that means you're getting through, not just the 9%, but that the people really feel as if this is an important statement that you're making and it's making a difference. So after 2010, I did co-found an organization to try and move from California more broadly to the country some of the ideas that we've been pushing in 2010. And I did it with a, a guy who had actually organized businesses in New England. A guy named Hemant Taneja, and he'd organized something called the New England Clean Energy Council. And what he tried to do was put together businesses and investors and policy people and researchers to, into an organization to try and provide an ecosystem that would work going forward. And if you think about what, how businesses really succeed, they gen, in a given area, they generally succeed in what we call innovation clusters. So I'm from the Bay Area. We have a huge innovation cluster that we call Silicon Valley. And it's a whole bunch of companies working on similar products. They're kind of competing with each other. They're kind of cooperating with each other. They create a huge cadre of people who are skilled engineers and venture capitalists and CEOs and marketing people and researchers at Stanford University and policy people in the state of California. And as a result, it becomes a real magnet for those businesses, and new businesses start and are formed from the, the alumni of old businesses. And that is actually the model of how you know, a big gr economic cluster of success grows. And that's what we're trying to produce around the country in energy, which is a huge business, and in Ohio, knowing that it's a regional and state question everybody is facing different problems, and that ultimately it will be these clusters, these innovation clusters that enable businesses to grow. That, it, that basically, if you have that good ecosystem and you start to attract the people and the talent, that businesses will come out of that, people will have new ideas that we've never thought of before. And we've actually called this the advanced energy economy, and it's a strange name. And let me just tell you why we chose it, because it says something about who we are and what we believe. One of the things we've said is advanced, because we really believe that the way to think about energy is a technology business. Regardless of whether we're talking about shale gas or solar or nuclear, we really believe the way that we're going to succeed in this is by thinking about it on a human capital and technology basis. That's what will win. That was what the United States does well. That's how we lead. That's how Ohio will do well. And as a result, we don't want to cut out companies by calling ourselves clean or green because there are implications to those names about what we won't even think about. And our idea is if you include all the costs, including the environmental costs, then we're extremely open-minded and willing to compare, to be objective. And the other word that's in there that's a strange word is economy. And the reason we call it the advanced energy economy is we want to compare it to the internet economy in the way that it becomes really a pervasive force. So that in 1996, living in San Francisco, California, I was talking to a good friend of mine who's a venture capitalist, and I referred to an internet company. And he said, Tom, please don't ever use that expression with me again. Do you call a company that uses an electricity, an electricity company. What you're calling an internet company is a company that has to provide a service and it uses the internet as a tool. And so calling it an internet company implies that you don't really understand what's driving that company. And you think that just being involved in the internet somehow is this magical beast that is gonna <laughs> let people succeed. Which, by the way, in 1996, people did think. And that's exactly how we're thinking about energy. That it's, you know, by the time Sears thinks it's an internet company, it's pervaded society. People now realize the internet is a tool to make your business succeed. People have got to think about energy as a tool that will let your businesses succeed. And honestly, in, uh, in Ohio, when you think about what cheap energy will do for Ohio, how many businesses it will enable. I mean, yes, there are all the actual energy businesses that are important, that will be based on the skills that are here and the technology that is here and the people that are here. But if you think about what, how much cheap energy will allow chemical businesses to compete globally, 
how many manufacturing businesses will now become competitive and how much they can grow. Our ability to succeed and compete in energy is something that is going to enable an enormous number of things. And in, from a jobs perspective, building out the infrastructure that will enable that to happen in and of itself is an enormous task, one which is well worth doing, but also is going to put an enormous number of people to work and make us all, you know, that is the definition of success, is moving forward in a good way and doing things that are worth doing and doing it competitively and succeeding. Um, the other thing I would say about the uh, AAA, let me make one more point about that, and that is this. We're really a principle-based company as opposed to a policy-based company. We believe that if we attack these questions in the right way, we will come up with the right answers as opposed to knowing the right answers and trying to convince people of what they are. So the three principles that we try and bring in thinking about energy are one is we really want full cost accounting. You know, when you think about the cost of energy, people love to talk about what it costs per gallon or what it costs per kilowatt hour. The question is, what are the things we're not including in those costs? Because it's absolutely important that we, that we include the pollution costs. It is not fair to say, I run my house very inexpensively, and one of the things I do is dump all my garbage in my neighbor's yard. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense, and yet that's actually what we do, because people really love to get down to the, the, do, the absolute dollar cost of energy. And if it doesn't include things, then we're always going to use the cheap energy where we don't include the costs. So that's one thing that I absolutely believe in. Secondly, you've got to believe in competition. Whatever we're going to do in energy, we need to enable all of the bright American entrepreneurs and inventors and crackpots to come up with whatever they can come up with and compete as hard as they can because some of those crackpots are going to turn out to be Thomas Edison. So when you think about what we're trying to enable, that's what we're trying to enable. We're trying to let people do all the crazy stuff they can think of. Honestly, looking at waste to energy this morning, I was going through the math, and it's really powerful. Those guys have eight plants. They have 17 on the drawing board, and they believe you know, that basically the sky's the limit. And that is a new idea that if you're at a cocktail party, very few people talk about waste management businesses as like the most interesting thing they can think of. And the third thing that I think we need to think about in energy is this. We need to be long-term in thinking. These are long-term decisions. When you build a plant, you're building a plant for you know, a minimum of 20 years, but often you're really talking about 40 or 50 years. The coal plants that are very controversial right now were really built around 1970. That's really when those plants started to be built. They're all fully depreciated. They're all way past how long that people expected them to live, but that's how these things really work. So when you make a long-term decision, you know you're going to be incredibly affected by price. And look, I'm not 100% sure this is true, but I believe I've spent my, my life looking at prices at least as much as anyone in this room. I mean, I look at prices all the time. And I can tell you that, you know, I have real-time natural gas pricing. I have real-time the price of a barrel of oil in different parts of the world. So I look at prices all the time, and I know they're really important. If you talk about natural gas at $2 per thousand cubic feet, that's the equivalent of a $12 barrel of oil. It's a six times energy equivalent. A barrel of oil costs between $102 and $120 a barrel. And that is an incredibly powerful fact for, for the state of Ohio. Because that gas is really not a global commodity, it's a local commodity. And if you can basically have energy at a, ten, a tenth or an eighth of the world cost, that is an amazing opportunity and in terms of what it enables. But the other thing that I know about prices that people forget and that gets me back to the idea of long-term decision-making is prices always change. People think, oh, the price of natural gas is $2 an MCF, and therefore the price of gas will be $2 an MCF. And I assure you that's not true. We've seen $12 ga natural gas in the last five years. And what's happened is we've completely changed the supply without changing the demand. If we do all the things that we're talking about doing and enable all of the uses for natural gas that we're talking about, the demand side of the, de of the curve will change, and the price will definitely change. So in thinking about how to, 
you know, in constructing an energy strategy for the United States, we can't have only one arrow in our quiver because the price of that, if the price of natural gas really changes, you're dead. If you're an investor, you've got to think about things from a portfolio standpoint so that you have more than one option when things change. So as much as I believe that natural gas, I mean, I've been here for two days and people are incredibly excited about the opportunity of natural gas and they're incredibly nervous about the environmental risk of natural gas. And to me, this is a perfect example of what, what advanced energy is. There is a technology solution for the risks of natural gas that we have to insist on, which is we have to insist on the fact that it be safe, and we have to insist that not a lot of that methane escapes. Because probably the single biggest environmental risk to the United States, believe it or not, is how much natural gas escapes if we're going to suddenly produce an enormous amount of natural gas. So I don't think people talk about it much. It's, it's sort of code word is called fugitive gas. So from the time you go and get the gas till the time you use it, some of it kind of leaks into the atmosphere and it's colorless. It doesn't smell. So no one really knows how much is leaking out. But people estimate it's somewhere up to 7% of the gas. If it's 7% of the gas, from a greenhouse gas standpoint, we're better off with coal. If we can get it down to 1%, then we'll reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 20 to 30%. So if we can actually get this right, we then have a fuel which we can really make a lot of money out of. The for a, a, at least as a bridge fuel is incredibly environmentally sensitive, will increase, and also lets us lead the world in a lot of ways. We suddenly are doing something right we can send that technology around the world, and we actually have not just economic leadership, the ability to compete in a whole bunch of new businesses, but we're also standing for something in what, to me, this whole idea of climate change and sustainability, suddenly we become leaders on the biggest issue in the world today, which is something that, as an American, I would dearly like to have happen, as a matter of fact. Um, let me say this. I, when I was growing up, the biggest baseball star in New York City where I was living was Mickey Mantle. And Mickey Mantle was this great natural athlete. And he was a wonderful young star. And he was also pretty much of a fall down drunk. And his career ended a lot sooner than the other people who were great baseball players of his era, mostly because he never took care of himself. And he was from a town, he was from a coal mining town in Oklahoma. And none of his male relatives had ever lived past the age of 40. They'd all died of coal dust. Uh, and so he figured he was going to die as well, and therefore, you know, he might as well get up and drink his breakfast and enjoy life as much as possible. And when he was about 55 years old, which is around how old I am, he said, if I'd known I was going to live this long, I would have taken better care of myself. <laughs> And, I mean, I'm not just digressing completely about baseball. Uh, I think the point is this. We're actually doing something now that to me is incredibly important. And I think it would be a crying shame if we looked back in 10 years and said we didn't take it with, we didn't understand the significance of what we were doing. We didn't realize this was as important as it was. We were too cavalier. We didn't insist on doing it right. We gave ourselves, we didn't really trust ourselves enough and our ability to get things done in the right way, and therefore we kind of cuffed it. You know, we got by, we ba basically made some money, we didn't hold ourselves to high standards, we assumed we couldn't meet the high tests. And I absolutely reject that. I believe, you know, we really don't want to be Mickey Mantle. We want to look back and say that we absolutely challenged ourselves to do the right thing that we succeeded in the most important things, and that we held ourselves to a high standard, and then we exported that around the world and changed the way other people saw what could be done, and we actually had the technology to sell them. So I am uh, extremely serious about uh, what energy can do for us. I think that it can really change health. I think it can change our economic competitiveness. And... I also believe that it's a 
huge leadership challenge. There are really two big prices in this world. One of them is money. You know, that's why people freak out about the Federal Reserve. And one of them is energy. And actually, the energy price that people freak out about is oil. And the reason for that is oil is by far the biggest commodity. All the other commodities, soft and hard, don't add up to oil. That's why people say, pay, pay so much attention to how much per barrel. I think actually the, the relative significance of oil to natural gas can change, but I think that if we focus too much on natural gas and forget the idea of a portfolio and allow that one source of energy to crowd everything else out, we will make the mistake we've made four times since World War II, which is when the price of energy goes up, we do a whole bunch of research, we come up with a whole bunch of alternatives, and then the price of energy goes down, and we say to heck with the alternatives, and we forget it, and we let the, all the research go overseas, and other people develop it, which is what happened in the 1980s. We have to keep in our mind that we need a portfolio, that we need to push on the new, um, the new technologies, and to trust ourselves that this is a people and technology business, that that's what will make Ohio succeed in this, that's what the new companies will come out of, is the expertise and work of people here. It's going to be a people success if we have it. And that's going to be true in the United States as general, in general. So I will um, end by saying, you know, I was in um, London about nine months ago. And I was staying at this funky bohemian hotel near our office, which I always stay at. And on the pillow of my bed was a little card and it had a say they have a different saying every day and the saying was from Mahatma Gandhi and the, the saying was be the change you want to see in the world so I, I said wow that's that's terrific be the change you want to see in the world so I called home and I was talking to my wife and I said honey you know I saw this this great thing on the pillow in my hotel be the change you want to be in the world Mahatma Gandhi there's a long silence and my wife says you've never seen that before huh I was like no. She said, Tom, I hear that every day of the week. I thought everyone knew that. And by the way, I've used that in a speech when you were present. <laughs> <laughs> so nonetheless, I would say, could we please be the change we want to see in the world? Thank you. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we are listening to Friday Forum featuring Thomas Steyer, co-founder of Advanced Energy Economy. We will return to our speaker momentarily for the traditional City Club questions. We encourage you to formulate questions for our speaker now and remind you that your questions should be brief and to the point. Today is the City Club's annual Forum on the Environment, made possible by a generous gift from Stanley and Hope Adelstein, who have joined us at the head table. Stanley Hope, will you please stand and be recognized for your support? <laughs> Today's forum is sponsored by Advanced Energy Economy Ohio. With us today at the head table or in surrounding areas are Kimberly Gibson and John Adams, Will you please stand and be recognized? We are pleased to welcome guests at tables hosted by Advanced Energy Economy Ohio, guests of Stanley and Hope Adelstein, Baker Hostetler, Nortech, and Smart Hotels. Thank you for joining us today. We would like to welcome students to today's program. Participation by students in our forums is made possible by a generous gift from the Cleveland Clinic. Will the students please stand and be recognized? Now we would like to return to our speaker for our traditional City Club question and answer period. We welcome questions from everyone, including guests. Holding the microphones today are City Club Operations Assistants, uh, assistants Nikki Vela and Marie Dabati. Uh, the first question, please. Hi, thank you for your uh, lecture today. I found it really interesting. I was wondering, um, do you think there's a way to find an energy source that will satisfy both the environmentalists of, excuse me, the environmentalist view and those more interested in jobs in the economy? 
I do, of course. Um, I, I think that in looking forward and talking to people about 2050, people honestly believe that if we're not carbon neutral at that point, we're going to be in a lot of trouble, and we're not going to get to carbon neutrality in 2012. So the idea that we can suddenly get to 2050 and have everything be carbon neutral is really unrealistic. So in thinking about what we need to do, I think we have to have that in our mind and do as much and spend a lot of money as a society and particularly through the government on research, on advances. But I think along the way, everybody's going to have to um, accept imperfection to get there. So I look, you know, I've been working, there's a very good environmental organization called the Environmental Defense Fund that's working really hard on the fugitive gas question. And they're working, trying to work as hard as they can with natural gas companies. And they're working with researchers at the University of Texas at Austin. And that's the kind of collaboration that is ultimately going to let us succeed. It is, I don't think we're going to succeed by um, getting in huge fights with each other. I think ultimately we're going to need expertise from a variety of sources. And people are going to have to understand um, different points of view. And ultimately we're going to need policy leadership. But we're going to need people to understand where we need to get and then to pull on the same ore if possible. And Mr. Steyer, I was struck at the opening of your comments uh, that the cost of uh, electricity in California at 12 cents a kilowatt hour versus around 2 cents here. Why is it primarily regulatory? I do remember when Enron was having so much fun gaming the California system. <laughs> or what other reasons can you tell us? Well, um, let me say that there's a huge difference. Those are not apples to apples prices, in all fairness. There is a big difference between Ohio and California prices. But those are exaggerated because uh, 1.7 cents per kilowatt hour is what my friends were getting paid, and they were kind of getting robbed blind uh, on that deal. So I think that at this point, they'd probably be getting something closer to four cents a kilowatt hour because they're a little more established and they have a little more volume to sell. And even that, there's a spread between a wholesale price that the utility is willing to pay and the retail price that they're going to charge a customer. But having said that, there's no doubt that one of the reasons that energy is cheap in Ohio is because there's a lot of coal. It's 90% coal. And that is a, an energy source that is very cheap if you don't include the health costs and if you don't take any, any, into account at all greenhouse gases. <clears throat> so that I think that's why natural gas actually is such an important opportunity for Ohio. Because with the prices here, it's actually as cheap or cheaper than coal. And we can actually get to a fuel that is as cheap or cheaper in the market and doesn't have the costs that aren't included in that price. So that in, in Ohio, one of the reasons that it is able to uh, compete on an international level, and I believe can compete more successfully on an international level, is cheap energy costs. So it's really important. In California, one of the reasons we use such little energy is because the prices are high. And one of the reasons we don't do a lot of manufacturing in California is because the prices are high. So that there are some differences between those prices, but there's an underlying reality to the question you're asking that's important. Mr. Sarah, thanks for, for speaking with us today. and. Um, and I really appreciated your comments, especially with regards to full cost accounting. Um, but I, I was noting that there wasn't necessarily a lot of addressing the demand side. Um, and you know, we're talking about perhaps, you noted the high price of oil. Uh, we're using 70% of that on transportation. Uh, I mean, perhaps we should be talking about changing our transportation systems and the demand side, perhaps freight versus trucking, you know, with regards to the amount of efficiency you can get uh, in the energy sector with combined heat and power versus, you know, current coal. Uh, and we're, we're producing to address, you know, the peak, the most that we're ever attempting to consume 
is what we're trying to make sure is entirely secure. So I would like to know if you think that there's significant uh, growth opportunities within demand response and, and energy efficiency in the coming years. Well, let me say, I'm a, I'm a freak about energy, but I'm really a freak about energy savings. I completely agree with you. You know, the best energy we can produce is the energy we don't use. Combined heat and power is something that I spent a lot of time on, believe it or not, because I was in charge of Stanford's redoing their energy system and moving to combined heat and power, so I learned much more than I ever wanted to know about it. But in general, I'm a huge believer that we have been extremely wasteful and that we're going to have all the things that you're saying are true. And in particular, I think we've been, a, you know, we've, to our extreme cost, we've been addicted to gasoline in terms of transportation. It's obviously something that's very bad for us geopolitically. It's, very, it's much more expensive than we recognize at the pump, which was a point I was trying to make. And I believe that there are a number of technologies that can replace it. But in order to make that change, there's going to have to be a lot of, there's going to have to be a, an, an awful lot of infrastructure created. So that, for instance, being the cheap SOB that I actually am, I tried to find out how many fueling stations there are for natural gas in San Francisco last week because I was trying, I need to buy a car for, and I was trying to decide which was the fuel I was going to use. In San Francisco, which is not that big a city, to be honest, there are three fueling stations. So from a point of view of convenience, you know, it, even if it were convenient for me, which it isn't, with only three fueling stations, they're going to be, they're going to be inconvenient for a lot of the people in San Francisco. So in order for it to happen, there's going to have to be things built. Now, having said that, and I don't want to get too far away from your question. Today, so I'm talking to these guys who are doing waste to energy, and the energy that they create is methane. So they create natural gas, and they have all of their, um, all of their vehicles are natural gas vehicles. And they're trying to convince municipal you know, governments to let them do waste to energy at the municipal sewage you know, treatment centers. If they do that, at every single one of them, they think they can create the equivalent of a gas station, which would be totally awesome. So things will happen. You know, I believe that if we do follow the principles that I described, which was basically um, full cost accounting, competition, and long range decisions, we will free up people to figure out how to do stuff. Like one of the things I really believe is the government's job is to enable all of these things to happen. If we have a smart grid, we will enable people to try a lot of things. And, and really, that's where we want to get to, is where people think, I'm not sure the electric car is the answer, but I want the electric car to be able to fail on its own. And, and that's really, if it's allowed to fail on its own, then something else will succeed on its own. But it'll work out in the, you know, with a, millions of people making decisions about what's best for them with all the information on the table. And that's how it's supposed to work. Yeah, I, I, th I, w I wanted to thank you personally for uh, your and One California Bank's uh, role in saving uh, Shore Bank Pacific uh, from more or less going under from circumstances that were uh, beyond their control. But Shore Bank Pacific is one of the is probably the nation's only eco bank, and I was uh, uh, glad to have an eco deposit there. And uh, One California Bank has stepped in and carried for forward. And I thank you. My question was to um, point out or ask you what uh, what you call AEE -E, uh, in the Ohio chapter has had has it had any luck with our current administration here uh, Governor Kasich particularly well I, I I have spent the last two days with uh, the people from the chapter here and you would be better off asking them from what I can tell actually we act we have real traction I think it is very hard to believe that any place where you actually organize businesses that are responsible for a lot of employment and a lot of tax revenues, that you won't be successful. I mean, my belief is, having watched the climate bill of 2010, at the same time that we were fighting this proposition in California, the Senate was considering the climate bill. And it, it obviously didn't happen, and I think it was a shock to many people that it didn't happen. But the truth was, there was no constituency for that bill. And really, 
the, I, I think the message from that is you need to have local people on the ground who are actually involved in the community doing productive things, who have respect, who do employ people to have any credibility. And in particular, if, if the, fr the traditional framework is going to be jobs versus the environment, you need people who are speaking for advanced jobs, technology jobs, and future jobs. So I actually think it has worked here, and I think it will continue to work, and I think we can actually change the framework of the conversation to one that's a lot healthier, where we make a lot better decisions. Um, we have here a very exciting situation with the gas, as you pointed out. Um, it's a natural resource. Nobody's going to take it away from us. It's going to be here in Ohio. And uh, so my concern today is that everybody jumps on the bandwagon once they have the solution for right now today and you pointed out very well that we need to think in much larger terms so any recommendation from your past political engagement how to get politicians to back off and really think longer term and not feeling like they need to make a decision right now today which i know will be the wrong decision regardless of what it is you know it's funny, in, in the attempt not to be just a complete idiot while I'm here in Ohio, I have read some polls and tried to read some speeches and, you know, learn about the governor's energy plan. And one of the things I've learned is that 70% of the people in Ohio believe that we should be going slower on natural gas to find out what all the ramifications are. So a huge majority believe that. I think a, a, a sizable majority also believes ultimately that the benefits will outweigh the costs, that we will end up going forward. Obviously, the federal government has come in with their own fracking legislation, which they've, the EPA have put off for a few years. But the, the fact of the matter is, we need, this is what government is for. Government is make, for setting regulations to make sure that people are protected from things that are bad and for setting rules so that people don't pollute unnecessarily and put their fellow citizens at risk. So from my point of view, it's, in, it's unambiguously important that we have rules here that people are forced to abide by that are safe on both of the two major environmental issues here. And I believe that it is something that we can do and that we must do and that industry will always fight against. You know, it's funny because as someone who went to Stanford Business School, as somebody who's always been in the private sector, I am amazingly skeptical of business people when they talk about policy because they're always talking, you know, the expression they're talking their book. They're always speaking in their own self-interest. You know, I've gotten so tired of business people explaining to me how, you know, the, the oil companies in California said they'd go broke if they had to pay lifting fees. I mean, they're making 19, I don't know what it is, 19 billion dollars a quarter. We're going to go broke if we pay a lifting fee? I don't think so. So I immediately discount what people have to say. I mean, the jo I don't know how to make politicians suddenly become responsible. I mean, it would be truly unfair for someone from California to come here to talk about responsible politicians. <laughs> but I do know it's important that we hold the line on this. And we have a high standard, and then we succeed and make a ton of money. I'm, I'm a private sector person. I really believe the way that we'll, this, all of this will be executed will be through companies. Does uh, water come into your thinking as far as the environment goes and the energy issues? You know, it, it's funny because I was making fun of my wife harassing me, and at least once a week she says, Tom, you know, you're so focused on energy, and in about five years you're going to come to me and say, you know, you were right. It's really energy, water, and food. It's all one thing. But you're, it's going to take you five years to figure that out. <laughs> so the, the answer is, of course it does. They really are all linked when you look far forward. And what, the reason I'm so focused on energy is I believe it actually is from a, from a policy standpoint is the thing that we can do in the United States best. We can have the most impact on and we can lead on and that can lead to all the other stuff. But I totally, I, I understand how linked all of these systems are, or at least I purport to understand. And, and I take your point. It is something that is incredibly important. Good afternoon. I am a student from Michelle High School, and I would like to know, have there been reported issues such as cancer or health problems from the 7% of natural gas that leaks into the environment? Uh, 
I'm sitting here trying to remember what I've read. I know that people are very concerned about uh, the air quality emissions. That's part of the new regulations that the EPA gave out yesterday in terms of how much gas is released and how it's captured in kind of the green rules. I don't know the health standards on it. And I think that if there were something very, the, the thing that people are really concerned about from a health standpoint is that the way that people are getting natural gas, this fracking, you know, the horizontal drilling and the forcing of water into it. The real question is, are we going to pollute our water and make people really sick from the chemicals that we force underground and that then get into our water supply? And I think that people have been incredibly upset and worried about that. And I've heard both sides, people arguing that there have been instances that have been very dangerous, and other people from industry arguing that those fears are overblown. But the one thing that seems clear to me is, those are, that is, it is not acceptable to have an energy source that makes people really sick, and that we must create the technology to make sure that doesn't happen. And I strongly believe from talking to people in the industry that we can do that. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we have been listening to Thomas F. Steyer, co-founder of Advanced Energy Economy. Thank you, Mr. Steyer. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org.